In this lesson, we're going to take a look at pivot points, snapping, and proportional falloff. Most of the time, transformations are based on an object's point of origin. But sometimes this doesn't give us the best workflow. And for that, we have to understand how we can change the pivot point around which an object is transformed. Up here in the 3D view header, just to the right of our transform orientations, where it says global, we have the transform pivot point menu. The default setting is median point. Now with just our cube selection, the median point is at its point of origin because it's dead center of the object. But if we were to say select the cube and the camera and then hit R to rotate, now both rotate around a point that is equidistant from the two objects' point of origin. Click on the icon here and you'll see some other options for pivoting. Now we don't have to take these in order. Let's take a look at the one above and the one below the median point. The icons are similar, so that means they're somehow related. Let's switch to active element. With our cube and camera both still selected, we'll hit R to rotate. Now both will rotate but around the origin of whichever object was selected last, as this is the active element in our scene. Switch to individual origins and do the same thing. Now both rotate at the same time around their respective points of origin. Now let's select 3D cursor from the menu. Shift right click and reposition your cursor somewhere else in 3D space and select the cube. Now when we rotate, it pivots around the cursor position. Similarly, if we select the cube and shift select the camera and we rotate, both will pivot around the cursor position. Finally, there's bounding box. This may, at first glance, seem similar to median point, but the difference is that median will place the pivot between the centers of all the selected object origins whereas the bounding box uses all of the object's outer boundaries and rotates from the center of that. The hotkey to bring this menu up in a radial overlay is the period key on your keyboard, not the number pad period. In this radial menu, there's an extra item labeled only locations. This can be toggled on or off, and if it's enabled, now when we rotate or scale a multiple selection, it only affects the position. Snapping is also an important tool which can affect our workflow. It has two components, this magnet icon which shows if snapping is enabled or not, and the snapping target. By default, snapping is set to incremental, and we've briefly seen this in action already, whenever we've held down control while moving, rotating, or scaling. Let's add some more primitive meshes here to play with. I'm going to shift right click to place my cursor somewhere, shift A and select sphere. Then I'll shift right click somewhere else, shift A and place a cone. I'll enable snapping by clicking on the magnet icon so that it turns blue. If I grab my cone and begin to move it about, notice how the motion isn't smooth, it's kind of jagged or stepped. This is because it's snapping to unit increments in Blender. If we click on X, we can constrain this movement to the X axis, and it will only snap to one unit increments along X. Holding down Shift will snap the movement to a tenth of the visible unit. Well, for as long as we're in metric. Now, if the magnet is not active, holding down Control will toggle snapping on for as long as we hold it down. This is a really handy hotkey in my opinion, and rarely do I have the magnet icon enabled just because I can do this whenever I need to. You will have noticed that there are a lot of options in our snapping menu here. To best explain these, we don't have to go through them all. Let's start by switching from increment to vertex snapping. I'll select my sphere and bring it close to the cube. As I do so, a small orange square will appear over the nearest vertex on the cube under my cursor, and the sphere will snap to this point. Notice, however, that the vertex 
of the sphere that is closest to this point is what snaps. Let's open up our snapping menu to see why this is the case. Up here, we've got this section called Snap Base, and it is set to closest, which means it will not only choose the closest vertex we hover over on the target mesh, but only the closest vertex on the selected mesh that will be snapping there. If we change our base to center and do the same thing, then the sphere's point of origin will snap to the cube's nearest vertex. Let's now pick two variables here. We'll snap to the center of an edge and snap active. I'm going to select our cone and shift select our sphere so that the sphere is the actively selected object. Now we'll move our selection close to this edge on the top of the cube here. Did you notice what happens? Because the sphere is the active object in this selection, this is what snaps to the target, in this case, the center of this edge. The cone comes along for the ride, kept at a relative distance from the sphere. One of the really helpful options when face snapping is this tick box next to align rotation to target. What I'll do to demonstrate this is create the top of a bolt. I'll add a sphere. Toggle into front view with my numpad 1. I'll tab into edit mode. In wireframe view, I'm going to box select all of these vertices at the bottom and delete them. You'll note that the object origin is in line with this edge loop that was at the center. Because the default size of this sphere was pretty big, this is going to be a little bit too big for our purposes. So we need to scale this down a little. I'm going to tab into object mode, snap our cursor to the sphere, That'll snap it to the point of origin here. Make sure that our pivot is set to 3D cursor, tab back into edit mode, and then hit S to scale. Everything should scale towards the cursor. Once I'm happy with the size, I'll toggle back into object mode, back into shaded mode, and rotate our view so we can see the cube here. Under our snap menu, let's select face, our base to closest, and enable a line rotation to target. We'll move the bolt toward the cube and place it on the top here. You'll notice that it kind of slides along this face. I'm going to use Alt D to create duplicates. Bolts all have to look similar, so it makes sense that these instances should share mesh data. If I duplicate it another time with Alt D and move it to an adjacent face, it should automatically rotate along the cube's surface. We can now cover this cube in bolts and quickly create something really cool. As an additional point to recall an earlier lesson, and to really nail down why I chose Alt-D for this duplication, we can select any of our bolts, tab into edit mode, and make a slight change to the mesh, and all the bolts will be affected. Now, up until now, we've had this magnet icon on, but the more common way to work is to hold down control whenever you need to go into snap mode. Next, let's look at proportional editing. Like snapping, there's an icon to toggle it on and off, and a menu to select what type of proportional fall off you would like to use. I'm going to delete everything here, snap our cursor back to the world origin, our pivot to median, and add a grid by going Shift A, Mesh, Grid. A grid is a pre-subdivided plane. If you take a look at the last operation window, you'll see that it has 10 subdivisions in both X and Y. If we toggle into edit mode, you should be able to see all the vertices that make this grid up. I'm going to toggle proportional editing on. The hotkey is O, and I'll select a single vertex. I'll hit G to grab, and you should notice that there's this gray ring around the cursor. Now, in case you don't, you can use your middle mouse scroll to shrink or expand until you do see it in your viewport. Now, as we move this vertex around, the vertices closest to it also move, but the further away they are, the less they move. In fact, the movement is sort of like a fairly smooth bell. I'm gonna right click to quit this operation and reset the grid so that we can look at the options in the dropdown. You'll notice that that first icon, the one that was selected, kind of looks like the smooth bell that we just saw. There are other options, and all these icons make it fairly obvious what the profile for that falloff could be like. 
I'm just going to select another one. I'm going to go with random and do the same thing as before. I'm going to select a vertex, grab it, and move. Now the other vertices inside that gray circle will move according to a random noise pattern instead of a smooth curve. This is a really good way to generate some rough terrain very quickly. There's a couple of other options that exist to make this tool even easier to use. I'm just going to switch off proportional editing for the moment. I'm going to select everything and duplicate this grid while I'm still in edit mode and just move it over to the side here. I'll re-enable proportional fall off and I'll use the smooth fall off here. I want to select a vertex on the edge of one of the grids here and move it. You'll notice that if the other mesh is inside that ring of influence, the fall off will also affect those vertices. I'm going to right click to undo this. And in my proportional fall off drop down, I'm going to tick connected only and do the same thing. Now, only the vertices that are connected to this grid over here will be affected. Now, it might be really obvious to say this, but proportional fall off is not limited to movement alone. You can scale and rotate proportionally as well. It's also not limited to edit mode. Let's say we have a grid of cube objects. They're all separate, and we wish to affect their position, rotation, and scale proportionally. In object mode, I can select any one of these cubes, enable proportional fall off, pick a fall off type, then grab, rotate, and scale this cube. And even if I'm in mid transform, I can scroll with my middle mouse wheel to include or omit surrounding objects from the fall off effect. Now, these concepts and more are covered in greater depth in our Core Fundamentals of Mesh Modeling course, but you already have at your disposal tools to make some really cool stuff. Get familiar with changing pivot points, snapping, and using proportional falloff, and then let's move on to the next lesson. <music>